If you've seen any of my previous videos, you know I think K-pop has some interesting things. I've been meaning to use this one tune in an example to demonstrate some ideas in future videos, but after really listening to it, I realized it deserves its own video. This song, of course, is One of These Nights, the first tune on Red Velvet's second mini album, The Velvet, released in 2016. We have a lot to talk about, so let's just hop right into it. However, before I start analyzing, I highly recommend listening to the entire thing on your own first, since I'm going to be stopping every few seconds to talk about stuff. I've linked the tune in the description. Seriously, pause the video right now and go listen to it. Okay, now let's go. The tune starts off with a neat little orchestral intro. Let's listen. It's only four measures, but there's a lot to unpack here. We start the intro with just two notes heard, the E in violas and cellos and D in the violins. Starting with an E in the bass creates a tonal ambiguity until it kind of resolves to a fragmented almost D minor 7 at the end of the measure. At the beginning of measure 2, we have a sort of C7 13 over B flat, which then resolves down to an A flat major 7, which then walks down to an ambiguous G minor 7 with an 11, before tastefully glissing up to the A augmented with a flat 9. Having just given a more conventional analysis to these four measures, I will say that it probably shouldn't be analyzed like this. There's an idea of vertical harmony versus horizontal harmony that I like to think about. Whereas vertical harmony has, as the name implies, more fleshed out vertical slices of chords that can be analyzed. Horizontal harmony focuses more on moving colors in individual lines that technically form harmony by virtue of being played together. Notice how each line has its own arc, distinct from the others, some of them coming in on offbeats halfway through the phrase, before finally coming together in measures 3 and 4 to form more vertical chords. Something I like is that previous chords only imply our starting key of D minor, and we really don't get a solid sense of tonality until that final, tensiony A augmented flat 9 implies D minor. This song is based off of a story about two lovers from the Korean festival Chilsok. This intro and the harmony, at least to me, almost feels like a prelude to a stage play, fitting for something like this. But anyways, let's continue listening. Trimming away the fat of these eight measures, it's really a fairly simple chord progression, the tried and true 2 5 3 6. My homie Ongaku concept did a video about this chord progression. Definitely check it out if you want to see a more in depth explanation. But it works really nicely for a few reasons. As we know, the 2 minor goes down a 5th to the 5-7, which resolves deceptively to the 3, in our case the 3-7 or 5 of 6, which then resolves down to the 6 minor, which goes down a 5th to the 2 minor again, restarting the loop. The pianist, however, got bored and decided to do some cooler things. One of the most common things we'll see in this tune are hybrid chords, or chords with an independent upper structure from the bass. Essentially, hybrid chords are mostly used for three reasons. As seen in our first hybrid, the G minor 9 over C, it's literally the same chord and voicing as our previous chord, but now over a C bass. This keeps the smoothest possible voice leading while still giving us chordal movement, essentially giving us a 2-5 G minor 9 to C9-13 feeling with minimal movement. Something else you'll notice though, is that in hybridizing this chord, they omit the third of the chord, that being the E, giving a slight functional ambiguity to it. Keep this in mind, as it'll come up later. Third reason is to introduce interesting tensions or colors, which is exactly what happens in our second hybrid, the G major 7 over A. So tastefully rolled downwards, we unexpectedly get a bright 7th of the G major 7, the non-diatonic F sharp, superimposed over our D minor melody. Functionally, this chord is modal interchange from parallel major, which is why it sounds so bright amidst the otherwise minor key chord progression. This chord then resolves to the more diatonic version of this chord, 
with the so-called correct minor key tensions before resolving to a C over D or a hybridized version of D minor. Like I mentioned earlier, hybrid chords can be used to give chords ambiguity, especially to our tonic, the D minor. Normally, D minor seven would be defined by its third and seventh, F and C respectively, then the root and fifth, D and A respectively. The hybridized C over D, however, only has the seventh, C, along with the E, the ninth, and G, the eleventh, completely omitting the other chord tones. Interestingly, even without most of the chord tones, we still hear this chord as a D minor, but slightly tension-y for a resolution. It functions almost like a sus chord, giving a taste of the tonic flavor without giving the listener the satisfaction of a proper resolution. At the tail end of the phrase, the pianist rolls a B flat major 7 sharp 11 for fun. I'm not sure why to be honest. It doesn't really voice leap particularly well, but it sounds cool at least. The next phrase is mostly the same, but we have an elusive yet strangely ubiquitous black adder chord in measure 10. If you haven't seen my secret anime chord video yet, I would highly recommend watching it, since it explains this wacky chord in more detail. Here it functions as both a dissonant color and a clever half-step resolving dominant chord. You'll notice the notes of the black adder don't line up with the melody at all. In fact, the A flat and E in the chord are a half step under the melodies A and F. So in a sense, it's a neat non-diatonic color that really pulls us downwards, but also plays into its substitute dominant-like function. Something that's neat is that a black adder chord is a hybrid chord, and this specific one resolves to another hybrid chord. Both the upper structure and bass resolve down a half step, with the A flat augmented resolving to the G major triad, while the B flat resolves down to the A. Super nice sound. At the end of the phrase, we similarly resolve to the C over D, but this time around, the upper structure resolves and we get the sweet release of a proper D minor, which is actually the first time in the tune we resolve to a real tonic D minor without any tricks. In my opinion, it really feels like this was a deliberate choice to kind of parallel the longing the two lovers feel in the Chilsok story. Or maybe I'm just desperate to use my film scoring degree. I'm sure it will be useful one day. Let's keep listening. <laughs> The pre-chorus starts out pretty standard, going to the 4, or B flat major 7, walking down to the 3, the A minor, and then walking down a fifth to the hybridized 1, the C over D. The next part is neat though, since the upper structure C from the background vocals, voice leads down to a B augmented, then a B minor 7 flat 5, the sharp 4. This goes into a series of shimmery diatonic hits, which end on a hybridized C7, setting up a grand resolution to the relative major's tonic, F. But what actually comes next? Before we discuss this, we need to talk about modulation. There are a few common ways to change keys. Objectively speaking, the cleanest or smoothest way to modulate is by using a pivot chord. Pivot chords are chords which function in two different keys and quite literally pivot between the two. This technique was especially common in classical music, but it's also appeared in modern tunes, such as the modulation in Whitney Houston's I Will Always Love You. The last chord in the bridge, E major, functions as the 5 in the original key of A, but becomes recontextualized as the 4 of the new key, B major. We'll talk more about pivot chords later in the video. Another common way of modulating is just going straight into the new key, or tonality, at the beginning of a new phrase. This produces a more jarring key change, but it's normally mitigated by still modulating into a key that's one flatter sharp away on the circle of fifths. Alternatively, really hip tunes like modulating along the relative axis, which I talked about in my Owl House video. This works because of the relationship between parallel major and relative minor. In essence, it's just modulation by minor third. Another Red Velvet tune actually does exactly this. Let's listen to the first few phrases of My Dear. having a relatively complicated sound. It's mostly just two five ones jumping around the relative axis. 
We start the tune in E flat major, then 2 5 into C minor, E flat major's relative minor. Then we 2 5 into G flat major, which is C minor's relative major's parallel minor's relative major. Then we 2 5 into E flat minor, G flat major's relative minor, before going back to G flat major in the chorus. Despite the seemingly frenetic key changes, there is a logic to it. There is also a precedent, however, for tunes to modulate up a half step, especially in pop or musical theater. Despite being technically a faraway key, it often works well melodically and in the form of the tune. Mostly because of the precedent and with clever songwriting, it's normally not a particularly jarring sound. Examples I can think of are Michael Jackson's Rock With You or Beyonce's Love On Top. So all of this talk about mitigating jarringness through clever modulation techniques was a preface to discuss how one of these knights handles this. Let's listen and see what they do. One of the most insane modulations I've ever seen. This is a rare instance of a tune modulating down a half step in the chorus, rather than the usual half step up. Instead of mitigating the change in accidentals, both the melody and harmony completely embrace it. The melody sounds as if it intends to stay on A, but then walks down to G sharp, which would be very non-diatonic in our previous key of F slash D minor. The chord on the downbeat is A major 9, which contains C sharp, G sharp, and B, all non-diatonic to F. This overall results in that super bright, looking into the sun type feeling when we hit the chorus. And it's not just because E major is bright, it's specifically because we're modulating from the warmer and more reassuring key of F down a half step to the brighter, punchy key of E. It's all about the difference between the two. It's kind of like voltage or something, but I failed high school physics, so I'm not sure. Something I've thought about is, why doesn't it modulate up a half step to F sharp, which would have more of a precedent and still achieve the bright sound? Apart from F sharp being way too bright in my opinion, the key of E works so much better with the melody. Take note of the scale degrees of the last note of measure 18 and the first note of the chorus. In the key of F, A is the third scale degree, or Mi if you're into solfege. In E, the first note of the chorus, G sharp, is also the third scale degree. Because of the downwards motion of the line wanting to end on A, having it end a half step down almost sounds like the entire tune is pitch shifted down a half step on the downbeat of the chorus. Listen to what it sounds like if the chorus is shifted up a half step. It sounds completely fine, right? But it's not nearly as cool as what actually happens. And by doing this, the downwards line can unexpectedly keep going down, which sounds pretty cool. Anyways, that's enough about modulations. Let's continue. The first chord of the chorus is the 4 the A major 9, which goes to a hybridized 2 minor, F sharp minor, but keeping the A major 9 in the upper structure. After that, we have a 2 5 of 2, which goes back to the 2 minor as expected, before going up to the heartstring pulling tensiony 5 of 6, the G sharp 7. As expected, it resolves to the 6 minor, albeit hybridized, before landing on music's favorite question mark, the sharp 4 minor 7 flat 5, in this case, B flat. Let's continue. Lots of fun things happening here. The first chord of measure 27 is a hybridized A with 9 and sharp 11, voiced so wistfully while still staying entirely diatonic. The next chord is also neat, which I facetiously notated as a sus4 with the tension 10. This is one of my favorite chord qualities, where the sus4 is lower in the chord, allowing the third to be placed a major seventh above it. Most of the time, sus chords omit the third, because it either sounds dissonant by having the third and sus4 a minor second apart from each other, 
Or, if the sus4 is moved up in the chord, the third and sus4 create a minor 9 interval, which also sounds a bit weird. But by having the sus4 closer to the root, while having the third as a so-called tension, they're a major 7th apart, which sounds so much nicer and has an almost meditative sound. But the fun doesn't just stop here. After these tastefully voiced diatonic chords, they hit us with this non-diatonic C6-9 over G, preceded by a step-up, step-down bass motion, once again slapping us in the face with a bright chord color. Then the 808 bass drop hits, taking us into the sick-ass trap beat. It's more of an arrangement thing than harmony, so I won't dwell on it too much, but it's really neat how there was no percussion up until this point, even through the first chorus. It really makes this drop feel that much more satisfying. Condensed, the post-chorus section is really just a 6 minor, 2 minor vamp, with the C sharp minor and F sharp minor respectively, but each chord is preceded by the respective dominant. The C sharp minor turns into the C sharp 7 over F, resolving to F sharp minor by walking up. Then, the G sharp 7 resolves down a fifth to the C sharp minor, restarting the loop. So cool. Measure 32 hangs on the 2 minor, giving us a little time to breathe before the melody just picks up back to the original key of F major slash D minor, with the harmony following on the downbeat of 33. Not much is different harmonically for the next verse through chorus, so I'll skip to measure 49. Let's listen. Earlier, I mentioned pivot chords, or chords that have a clear function in two different key centers and serve as a bridge for modulation. In this section, we have two very clear pivot chords. Let's take a look. 49 through 51 are mostly the same. At first glance, C69 over D has the exact same vocal harmonies and upper structure voicing, so it seems to be the same as the previous instance, but the change in bass note makes all the difference. Whereas in the original occurrence, C69 over G, it was an inversion of the normal C69, implying a modal interchange flat 6 kind of sound. This new version is over D, which is instead a hybridized D7 with tensions. This could function in our key of E as modal interchange flat 7 7 kind of sound, but on the downbeat of the next measure, we land squarely on a homey G major, retroactively contextualizing the chord as the hybridized 5 of G major. Something that is so cool is that the melody in 52 also acts as a pivot, tiptoeing so carefully around both keys of E and G major. You'll notice all of the notes in measure 52 are diatonic to both keys. Also notice, similar to my dear, which we analyzed earlier, we're modulating a minor third up, counterclockwise on the relative axis. Or rather, we're modulating to E major's parallel minor's relative major. Once we're in G, we have a pretty standard 1 to 4 type sound, with the G major C major movement, but then something interesting happens. We land on a F sharp minor 7 flat 5. This chord is diatonic to G major, as it's the 7 minor 7 flat 5, but the chord that follows is a hybridized B7. The hybridization is important because it adds a natural 9, C sharp, to the top of the chord, which is no longer diatonic to G major. In addition, normally, B7 in the key of G major would be a secondary dominant that resolves to the diatonic E minor. However, since it would be a minor resolving chord, it would have the flat 9, or C, as a tension, rather than what we have here, the natural 9, C sharp. This then takes us back to the key of E major, resolving deceptively to the 4. You know what that means. Both the F sharp minor 7 flat 5 and the A over B are galaxy brain pivot chords for multiple reasons. First, let's look at the F sharp minor 7 flat 5. It's entirely diatonic to G major, as you can see. In E major, it's almost entirely diatonic, except for the C. Let's look at the next chord, the A over B. In G major, it's almost entirely diatonic except for the C sharp. In E major, it's entirely diatonic. Having one chord become retroactively less diatonic, while the next chord on hit similarly sounds slightly non-diatonic, creates a harmonic gradient, allowing us to modulate in the smoothest way possible. It's all because of the C in F sharp minor 7 flat 5, which becomes the C sharp in A over B. In addition, 
you'll notice F sharp minor seven flat five and A over B technically form a two five relationship. But where the former would set up a five that resolves to E minor, the latter wants to resolve to E major. Absolutely amazing. By the way, something to note is that in the pickup to the last chorus, they finally give us what our ear supposedly wants to hear. The melody in the pickup walks down to the third scale degree of the key and stays there, rather than continuing down an additional half step as it had previously. After doing this twice, they subvert our expectations by playing what would otherwise have been expected. Let's listen to the rest of the tune, and then I'll give my closing thoughts. Most of the same here harmonically, except for the colorful A minor over D in 61, which resolves down by half step to the C sharp 7. If you have keen ears, you probably heard the yucky chromatic approach the keyboard player hit in measure 62. Since it's not reflected in any other instrument, nor in the official piano version, I chose not to notate it, and reason the pianist must have gone off the deep end from harmonic overstimulation. Everything else is mostly the same until we get to the penultimate chord, the A major 7 flat 5 over F. This chord is essentially a cooler voicing of that previous C sharp 7 over F we had earlier, but now with a flat 13 and a natural 9. And with that, the tune ends. There's so many more things to say about the arrangement, melodic writing, string lines, mix, and imagery as it relates to the story it was inspired by, but I really only care about harmony enough to write six pages of script. As an aside, the Korean lyrics took forever to notate, as I tried typing all of it by hand rather than copying. Having just moved to Koreatown, I'm trying to learn a thing or two about Korean by the end of the year. I made a bet with someone that I'd be pretty fluent by then, but to be honest, it's not going very well. So if anybody is offering Korean lessons, please hit me up. I don't have any money because I'm kind of a starving artist, but I can't teach you music theory. I'm kind of in a bind because things didn't go very well with my last teacher. Cadence, 2년 이하 means this is fate. Repeat it after me. 2년 이하. 2년 